And let's begin reading at Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power, the dunamis, the dynamite of the spirit. And the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And as he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's what? Favor. Then in front of family members, 10 elders that would be sitting in front of him that asked him to, to speak in the synagogue. It says he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Abba, we pray, Lord, that these words become living words. That, Lord, you would remove distractions. That you would break strongholds. And that you would set your people free. For the glory of your name and your name alone. In weakness, show yourself mighty. Amen. Did anybody, uh, anybody say, wow, things are really going downhill here at Cross Point. Pastor Tim is wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> the reason I'm wearing this t-shirt, I wish you could all see it. Pastor Brian's wearing one. Um, these were designed by... Um, R.J. Yard, and uh, after one of the sermons that I preached uh, here a while back ago, from, and it's on the back of the shirt, it's, it's Luke chapter 24, verse 49, um, which Jesus says to his disciples, wait from the gift of the Father to be clothed from on high with the Holy Spirit. And so he took that, and um, made a t-shirt with clothed with power. And here's the C, and here's the P. And what's really cool, the W is in the form of a cross, or in the, a crown around the cross. And uh, he gave this to me a few weeks ago, and I just love it, because also you have the CP in there, right? Cross point. Um, <laughs> I love it, and, um, and that's what we're going to talk this morning about, um, to be anointed with God, to be clothed with power from on high, where God puts on this incredible clothing upon his people, upon his children that he loves. And by the way, if you want a t-shirt, can they come to you? They can come, so that, just see if you, you want a CP t-shirt. Um, they're really cool. Um, and, and that's where fasting leads. I, I really believe that. And we've seen that already. Just 
manifestations of God's power, of God's spirit moving among us. And when you look at the context of this passion, and we'll use this for a little bit of review. So if you could put up, um, there we go. Let's review a little bit. And in light of this passage and what goes on before this passage, Jesus is fasting, but all the way back to Jesus in the Jordan River. Okay, we started our fast by saying, we want to encounter the face of the Father, the presence of the Father. If all that happens is that, the fast truly will be worth it. And we said that, that we would be overwhelmed by the glory of the Father's love. So look at Jesus. If you go back to chapter 3 in your Bibles, Jesus is at the Jordan to be baptized by who? John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance. Jesus did not sin. He did not need a baptism of repentance, but he was identifying with our sin. But something really cool is going on because what other story in the Bible talks about the Jordan River going way back in the First Testament? The crossing. We're after how many years of the Israelites in the wilderness? How many years? Forty. God says now it is time to enter into the promised land. And so they, they were baptized in the Red Sea, kind of a baptism that signified their salvation as they came out of Egypt. And now they're baptized in the Jordan River, coming now anointed by God in the Jordan. Not a baptism of salvation, but a baptism of the Holy Spirit to go into the promised land and take it over for making it into the kingdom of God. So Jesus is showing, here comes the kingdom. Here comes the glorious kingdom of God that all the prophets and even back to the Torah, they're, they're pointing to. And so Jesus is baptized. And as he's coming up, the Holy Spirit comes out like a dove. And then the voice of the Father is heard. This is my son whom I love, whom I'm well pleased with. And so Jesus, right at his baptism, before he starts his public ministry, he encounters the overwhelming love of the Father. How many of you this season of fasting have held, felt the Father's love? Amen. I know going through these 21 days... Um, just a resurgence in my own spirit that I am a child of the king, that, that I'm loved by God and his perfect love cast out all fear. And so Jesus is anointed and, and he knows the father's love and then he's attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit because where does the Holy Spirit, according to Luke chapter four, verse one, where does the Holy Spirit lead him? To the wilderness for how many days? Important number in scripture, right? And he is fasting. It's the spirit that leads him. Jesus is led. He's anointed uh, by the father. The love of the father is all over him. But now he becomes attentive to the voice of the spirit. Now, now in, if I was thinking about this and I was anointed by God and I had all the courage because he loves me, I would have thought now is a good time to start my public ministry. But no, God works in mysterious ways. And instead of leading him right back in or into Galilee, the, the spirit of the father, he's attentive to that voice and says, no, before the work that I have you do, I want you to go into the wilderness. And how often I've seen in people's lives that when God anoints them, he doesn't always send them right away into their calling. He first sends them into a wilderness and a trial and a struggle. And I believe, too, that talking about that with the elders this morning, because of all the miracles I've been hearing uh, the past three weeks, 
we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was not us, but it was the spirit of the living God that put on the elder's heart that this is the season of fasting. We, we truly believe that this was of God. This is a God moment. This is God's timing to teach us, to, to mold us. And for some, these 21 days have been a wilderness. I talked to a family this week. It, it has been a, an, one of the worst weeks of their life, what they went through. Awful wilderness. And in the middle of their fasting, and their fasting as a family, in the middle they're still saying, God, you know, we don't know what you're up to, but we're going to keep looking to you. There, there's been temptations and trials. And so Jesus, he's attentive and he listens. And then he goes into this battle where the enemy is fighting against him during these 40 days. I also think he's being, as his fasting season, I think God just strengthens us. And so last week was a beautiful week for us as a congregation um, because we confess sins, amen? We confess corporate strongholds that live among us. And I believe God is breaking down those strongholds. And then to hear from many of you this week about individual strongholds. And so Jesus, here he is, he's, he's fasting and Satan comes to him. And the first thing he says, you know, Jesus, let me check your identity. If you are really the son of God, if God really loves you and you're the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. And 40 days, Jesus has not eaten. I, I, and I can't wait to start eating some bread, amen. Uh, you know, I, and yet Jesus, Jesus gets this temptation, but he is so fed with God that he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, man shall not live by what? bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I don't know about you, but, but during these 21 days of fasting, the bread of God, the word of God has become so precious to me that this word just lights up. And I, I see things that I haven't seen before, and God ministers through the word. And you know what? I need this more than Panera Bread, amen, or Corner Bakery. I, I need the Word of God. And Brian and I were talking a, few, uh, a week or so ago. You know, I, I wonder if that temptation wasn't really even hard for Jesus because he's been feasting on the Father and the Father's love. And suddenly the things that we think are so needy and, and that we need, they're not as big anymore, amen? They don't matter as much. And, and then Satan comes to him in Luke's account, takes him to a high place and says, you know, Jesus, just bow down to me. You won't have to go through all this other stuff and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6.13 and he says, the word says, worship the Lord and worship him only. Uh, during the fast, I, I think God has revealed, I, I know in my heart, strongholds, sins. And, and you know, the, the, the things that entice us or the strongholds in our mind when, when we fast and we seek his face, the things that the enemy offers, you know, they're not all that, are they? They're not. The world keeps saying you need the things of this world and I'll give it to you. Just sell your soul to me. Just sell your heart to me. Go after the dollar. Go after uh, the stuff of the world. 
and it's going to fulfill your desires. And, and when we fast and when we pray, we realize, you know, that stuff of a world that we worship, the, the gods that we worship, the idols that we worship in America, they're not all that. It's amazing that, you know, you can turn on the TV while you're fasting. And sometimes I'd watch the news and I did have to confess to you, I did watch a football game last week. And all God's people said, go Broncos. Um, sorry, Seahawks fans. But, but even watching that and watching the commercials, Nate, are you saying amen? Amen, amen yes. And he's a Seahawks fan. So um, the watching those commercials, you know, there's always cars and there's always beer and there's always girls. It kind of nauseates you. It, the, the lie, the marketing of the, of the enemy, it doesn't satisfy. And so Jesus says, I don't need that. And when we fast and pray, we realize we don't need that. And the final thing was, you know, Jesus just become really popular and, and, and dazzle the crowd by jumping off. And, Jesus, and Satan even uses Psalm 91. And, and Jesus, Jesus says, Deuteronomy 6, 16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so, so Jesus broke through the lies and, and the deceit and the temptation. And he did that for us. Christ did that for us because Jesus was obedient, his perfect obedience. It is applied, the Bible says, his obedience defeating Satan and is applied to me in my salvation. Jesus resisted the temptation and he did that for me. And it leads finally to this transformation that this fast will lead to a powerful anointing on our body to expand the glorious kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what's going to happen and what I believe is already happening, that this anointing is falling on the body of Christ to expand God's kingdom and God's domain. And Jesus Christ will be exalted. Jesus Christ will be lifted high. So Jesus comes, and here we see this transformation happening, this anointing happening. He goes to Galilee in verse 14. And he goes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he goes and does incredible things as we read the gospel accounts. He driving out demons, he's healing the sick, and he's preaching with authority, unlike some of the teachers of his day. And Jesus made it his habit to, to be in the synagogue on Sabbath day, and, and he would teach there. I believe revival happens in the church, and Jesus goes first to the church. And then Luke records that he goes to Nazareth, his hometown, where everybody knew him. And in their service, they would open up with the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love him with all your heart and all your soul and, and all your strength. And then they would do a prayer, and then they would do Thanksgiving, then they would do an old uh, reading from the Torah, and then they would do another prayer, and then they would do a reading from the prophets, or the prophets. And so here Jesus is reading from Isaiah. He turns to Isaiah chapter 61. And here's what he reads. And he adds Isaiah 58, 6 in here as well. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has, what? Anointed, Anointed me. And we want to look at that word just for a few minutes this morning. Anointed. Isaiah, and you go back to Isaiah, and you go back to the Hebrew word in Isaiah chapter 61. And the Hebrew word for anointed means to be splashed with or covered with oil that is on somebody's hand, and they smear you. 
So they take oil and put it on the hand of someone and they just smear you with it. That's where that word comes from, to be smeared with oil, to be touched by a hand. The New Testament word that's used, the Greek word that's used uh, right there is the word we use for Christ, which means the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised one, anointed from God. Same word that is used for Christians. The anointed ones, that's what Christians mean, Christian means. The anointed one, those who have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 16, there's this little boy named David. And God says, we need a new king because the anointing has fallen off what king? Saul. Saul. Saul chose not to listen to God. Saul chose not to obey God. So God was taking away the anointing. And he comes to this most unlikely little boy or a teenage boy named David. All his great big son, the brothers, Samuel went and looked at, and they looked good. And, and God says, no, you look on the outward, I look on the inward, Right? And so he comes to David and he anoints, he takes out a horn of oil, pours it over the head of David, touches his head, and it said, the Holy Spirit was on David. The anointing, the presence of the Spirit. And so Jesus is saying here, that anointing, and in the Old Testament you saw the anointing was on priests and on kings and usually done by a prophet. Now here comes Jesus. He is the prophet who is declaring the word of God. He is the high priest that intercedes for us, and he's the king, bringing in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is saying, guess what? I am the anointed one. The spirit of God has fallen on me as prophet, as priest, as king. And then he preaches this message I've come as the anointed one to preach good news to who? The poor. When God's anointing comes, the word of God becomes alive. The word of God becomes powerful. And the word of God is good news, amen. Good news. And so Jesus is saying, I've come as the anointed one to bring you the good news of the cross. The cross is God's good news that reveals that your God is not a God who is, who is a, a sour-faced God. Your God is a God who is a good God. And his goodness is seen in the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ. When the anointing of the Holy Spirit is present, when God is near, you don't need a lot of fancy sermons. You don't need to hear sermons about seven ways to have a successful marriage. It's good, right? Want to have successful marriages? There's a time and a place for that. You know what's going to give you a successful marriage? The goodness of Jesus. The good news of the gospel. You don't need sermons about how to be a good friend to other people. You understand the cross. And you understand what a friend I have in Jesus. Yes. It will transform you. See, in America, we have all these packages. We have all these promotions. Come and hear this person. Come and hear this thing. Look at this new series. What we need in America is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This, this, this is what changes hearts. This is what changes lives. This is what will transform you. 
that you are dead in your sins, that you are dead and rebellious against Almighty God, and God loved you so much out of his goodness. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ. And when the Spirit of God comes, this becomes everything. This becomes the only thing. And so Jesus says, I've, I've come to bring good news, and this is what the good news does. This is what the gospel does. And it comes to the poor. See, if you're not poor here this morning, this stuff is meaningless. Now, now, my poor, and a great commentary of this is found in Isaiah 66. In Isaiah 66, the prophet says, God says, these are the people I esteem. These are the people that I love. Those who have a broken and contrite spirit, I will not despise. The proud, the haughty, the arrogant, I will despise that, but I will come to the broken and the contrite. Jesus picks up on that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And we confessed, and you, some of you confessed to me last week. Yeah, this pride thing. And the Holy Spirit is showing you. And that's a spirit of grace and mercy. And God says, let me wash that away. Let me wash your arrogance, your, your pride away. Let me love you. Stop trying to control life. Because the good news goes to the broken and the humble. And that's what fasting does. It shows our sin and it humbles us. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And I've come to, Isaiah 61, I've come to let the captives go free. You're not bound by Satan. You're not bound by the enemy. Thursday night, Pastor Brian, 25 people, I believe, are here. Celebrate recovery right in the student center, just starting it, just launching it. God comes to break addictions. God comes to break strongholds. We started this series when we talked about Matthew 6. We started this series on on prayer and the 12 steps. And and when we understand the blood of Jesus Christ, addictions are broken. As somebody said to me, I don't need beer anymore. Isn't that awesome? I don't need caffeine anymore. Man, I haven't had Starbucks in three weeks. I'm still amped. Amen. I don't need it. Because the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, he breaks strongholds, he breaks addictions. Recovery of sight for the blind. We've come out of a dungeon of darkness and and God gives us new eyes to see. You know, our eyes start being taken off of ourselves, right? Right? And we begin to see the kingdom of God. We begin to see that church is not about us, amen. It's not about my wants and my desires. We begin to be kingdom people. And we begin to see with the eyes of Jesus, the lost, the hurting, the broken, the wounded. We become sensitive to the spirits sensitive to our neighbors. Uh, I love this. Somebody was sharing it with me this week. One of the people that they put up there when they're praying and during the fasting season for a, a divine appointment with a neighbor. And this person shared with me, uh, Pastor Tim, this, this neighbor, I never see them. And we, we, we're, we're walking and we ran right into each other. And, and I, I know I need to be the love of Jesus Christ to the neighbor. I, I haven't seen her much, and God just opened my heart and my eyes. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the anointing. And that's what Jesus does. The cross does. He opens our eyes to the kingdom. And we begin to see others, and we begin to love others as ourselves. And, and he does that physically. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, but he does that spiritually. 
to release the oppressed, verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What is that verse referring to, the year of the Lord's favor? The year of the Lord's favor is, according to Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8 and following. What is the year of the Lord's favor? Jubilee! Every 50 years, and we don't know if the Israelites ever practice it, but it's pointing to this day. It's pointing to the day that Jesus comes in the synagogue. It's pointing to the kingdom coming. And every 50 years, they were to release all the slaves, all the captives. The land was going to be returned back to the rightful owner. It was a year of celebration, a year of incredible joy and singing, a year of no work. Amen. And what it's pointing to, and they would blow the trumpet, it was pointing to the messianic age, the kingdom of God. And when Jesus comes, this kingdom is ushered in. Amen? Amen. And you and I are part of that kingdom. And so Jesus comes in, he's fasting, and then he's transformed by the anointing of God. And then he brings this message, the same message that you and I are called to bring. Now, turn with me, or it'll be up on the screen, to Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Because sometimes we think, you know, Jesus, that's you. You preach. Jesus, you heal. Jesus, you raise the dead. And we, we've gotten some really poor theology, even in our circles, that teach, you know, all those things that happened in the past, all those miracles, all those signs and wonders, you know, that was for really back then. We have the Bible, and that's all we need. That teaching is right from hell. It is not the Word of God. Because here you go, right here, Jesus is saying, okay, the things that I did and I'm doing, this is what I want you to do. And he gave them power and authority to drive out demons, to curse diseases. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to do what? Heal the sick. And then if you flip over, he said, well, that's just the 12 disciples. You go to chapter 10 and there's 72 and he does the same thing. It's probably the same story. It's just expanded. And he does this. You go and you do those things. Preach kingdom. Heal the sick. Drive out demons. And where in the Bible is the only place where you see Jesus is full of joy? Any guesses? Luke chapter 10. After they came back. And here's the, these disciples and the 72. After they come back. It says, at the time, verse 21 of chapter, at the time they come back, they cast out demons, heal the sick, preach the kingdom. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have not hidden these things from the wise and the learned. You've revealed them to who? Little children. Yes, Father, for this is your good pleasure. Amen. What brings Jesus Christ joy? It's when you, anointed by the Holy Spirit, you live the kingdom, you teach the kingdom, you model the kingdom, you pray for the sick and then they're healed. You cast out demons and they're gone. See, that's the work of the church. Did you get that? That is the work that expands the kingdom of God. And I love it this morning. I think that was a prophetic gift to Cross Point. This little boy who's here for the first time that kneeled and worshiped. Because it says you've taken, and you've taken this from the wise, and you made it known to little kids. I just end with this story. I was. I was reading this week about a little boy, 10-year-old boy in South Africa. He went to a crusade, and he received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at this crusade. 
But he waited till the evangelist was all done and driving home, and he run out and ran, ran out in front of the evangelist's car, and he said, stopped him, evangelist was tired, he got out, what can I do? He says, would you, 10-year-old boy, would you pray that I would receive the Holy Spirit? I've asked Jesus into my life, but you talked also about the Holy Spirit. I don't know who he is, but I want him. So right there in the middle of a plane in Africa, the evangelist prays for him, and, and the presence of God just lit this young little boy up. He walked several miles all through the night to his village. And he, and he declared later that it was like he was walking on a cloud. He, he didn't even remember it. Gets to the village. A lady is walking out of her house and she's sobbing and she's whole. She had already lost one daughter from cholera and her other daughter had an incredibly high fever. Nothing was helping. And the little boy saw her crying, says, ma'am, why are you crying? She says, my, my daughter is dying of a fever. And he says, ma'am, I just received Jesus into my heart and the evangelist just prayed for me and I have this Holy Spirit. Spirit. I don't know who he is, but I have him now in my heart, and I want to pray for you because I know Jesus can heal your baby. Woo! Praise over the, the girl, the, the fever breaks. Back to normal. The, the lady goes to the chief of the village and uh, tells the chief. The chief asks for this 10-year-old boy to, to come over to, to his house. And he, he wants to hear the story about Jesus and the evangelist and the Holy Spirit. He says, because I have this daughter who's crippled and she's never walked, never. And I brought her to Cape Town and the greatest doctors could not heal her. And we spent all of our money. Do you think your Jesus will do this for my daughter? The 10-year-old boy, ten boy with face says, sure he will. He goes into a room, lays hands on her, and her, he could hear the crackling of her bones coming into place. The daughter jumped up and started walking. Oh, the chief calls the whole village together. And he says, you need to hear about this boy's Jesus, his God. So a 10-year-old said, he preached exactly what the evangelist did the night he was saved. And the village turned their life over to Jesus Christ and the pastors, the churches, pastors came alongside the 10 year old boy and the churches were full. God hasn't changed. We have. See, it's interesting, the word antichrist, we read that in the Bible, we're all scared, Ooh, the antichrist is coming. You know what the Antichrist means? It's not anti-Jesus. You know what Antichrist means? Anti the anointing. See, the cults love Jesus. Mormons can say, yeah, we love Jesus. Jehovah Witnesses say, we love Jesus. Muslims, yeah, he's a great prophet. Add Christ to the end and see what they say. No. He's a good teacher. We love Jesus in America. He's a good teacher. He's a good role model. You add Christ and the anointing, Satan hates that. That's why Satan will do everything in his power to bring about the spirit of the antichrist that we don't need the anointing. Guess what? We need the anointing. We need the spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we're dead. The church won't go forward. The church is called to go and preach the gospel, not to be a cozy club. You know, the atheist has started churches. You know that? In LA, there's a big church started by the atheist. And it's growing. And they got music and they got light shows and they bring in motivational speakers. And you know what? They said, we learned from the church in America. If we put on a good show, we have a good lights and we get a good music going. Hey, everybody wants community. And so the, the, these atheist churches are growing in New York and LA and they're just modeling the church. But one thing they don't have is the anointing of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have. That's what the church needs so desperately. That's where I believe fasting brings us. I'm gonna end with this. Sorry, I told you I was gonna end a long time ago. I've read this to you before, but in, in my fasting, the Lord just brought me back. This is a book my mom gave to me for a devotion a long time ago. 
And this is what burns in my heart. I don't know how much more time I have left in this life, but I will not stop praying for this and this kind of church. You may ask me to leave and that's okay. I will love you. But this is my passion. This is my dream. And it quotes from Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord who is, who was, who has come, the Almighty. Behold, you stand on the threshold of a new day, for I have truly great things in store for you. Yes, you have not the power to conceive what I'm about to do, for I will bring to pass a new thing. You will rejoice exceedingly. You have heard of the showers, but I say to you, I will send a mighty downpour. Many have cried out of me from a hung hungry hearts and have not yet received the fullness or seen my glory. But I say to you, in the day of the great deluge, which is coming, many will come to know the reality of my power who have until now not seen or dreamed of such things. Many who are scoffers and many who are honest doubters will find themselves swept away on the swelling tide of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For this is the time of the last great outpouring. outpouring. This is the day of preparation for the coming of the Lord. Many shall rejoice together in the Spirit's work who are now at sword's point over doctrinal disputes and barriers over tradition. We have all these denominations, right? This is so cool, guys, because Wednesday morning, I'm praying with the pastors of the city, and I said, hey, would you guys just join us for our Good Friday service? We're gonna just, we're gonna be one church in the city on Good Friday. What do you think, guys? All of them were there, said, yep, we're coming. Amen? That's not very enthusiastic, guys. Mm. Amen. But let your heart be encouraged, for a new day is dawning, a day of repentance. We were doing last week. A day of gathering of my people, for there shall not continue to be a barricade and, iso and be isolated behind walls of prejudice. Amen. I am the Lord. I will be worshipped in spirit and in truth, not in big... big uh, Bickery or sectarianism or the narrowness of denominationalism. Does, does Jesus see denominations? Absolutely not. The world, and this is what I love, the world is waiting for a robust church to minister to the needs. And how can an ailing, disenmembered body bring healing to the sick in a dying world? Surely I will pour out my spirit and by prophecy, signs, and wonders, by many different types of miracles and healings, I reaffirm my veracity of my word and bring the message of the gospel of redemption to many who would otherwise never give heed. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Stand firm in me. Never waver. Be faithful regardless of apparent failures or discouragement. For my word shall surely be fulfilled, and your eyes shall see revival in proportions such as never been witnessed in the history of the human race. Keep your eyes on the end course. Victory is secured already. Do not let the hurdles cause you consternation. Stay in the running. Truly, I am at your side. According to each day, shall your strength be. We've learned that in fasting. And the race is not won by the swift, but by the obedient. They shall receive the prize. All God's people said, I'm going to live that the rest of my life. I'm going to live into that. I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to believe a revival is coming. I believe it's already happening here. And God is going to unite us and do great things. So we bring his love to a world that needs to see Jesus. So would you stand with me? And, and what we're going to do, and, and I asked the elders to do this. Somebody said, Tim, you need to do this. So I asked uh, the elders to do this to me this morning. They just, they just laid hands on me and just prayed over me because I can't do this. Some, I can't preach without God's blessing. 
I can't live without God's blessing. I can't do what Jesus wants me to do without God's anointing, without God's blessing. So prayer team, elders, if you can just disperse yourself around the room here. And while we're singing these songs, um, we want to just pray that anointing means laying hands upon you. And we just want to pray for you and bless you and love you and encourage you to be everything that God called you to be. God called us in Luke 9 to go out with this gospel message, to to go out and heal, to go out and prophesy, to go out and share the message of the kingdom of God. That's our calling, not to be a country club, amen? But to be a place that goes out into the world with the love of Jesus Christ. I need that. And so let us as, as staff and elders, and, and, and if you're staying there, you know, we may just come to you, okay? We may just come to you. So um, let's have some people, anyone in the aisle here, get Jim, are you in the aisle? You can pray. So you can come up front. Uh, in the back, is, we got some people in the back. John Vortman, you back there. Okay, during this song, um, come forward, come in the middle, come in the back, and let us just bless you and anoint you and pray the Holy Spirit upon you.